Um, Theodora, what is 5G? Have there been studies on 5G safety? What did the studies say? Is 5G definitely a health risk or is more research still needed? Can we avoid this? And uh, tell us about your lawsuit against the FCC, all that. Okay, so we believe that 5G is definitely a health risk and I'll tell you why. It goes to the question of what is 5G? So 5G promises to tie together the internet of things and it will involve hundreds of thousands in the United States, all, nearly a million new cell towers called by industry short, uh, small cells. That's the term. So small cells are really a, a shorter cell tower in addition to more macro large towers, millions of new towers worldwide. So there's going to be more uh, cell wireless networks that are going to be in place with antennas that are increasing the ambient, that everyday level that you are exposed to when you walk outside your door that you can't control. And that's a really important piece here is that we can make all these changes at home, which are so important. But if there's a cell tower outside your door, it becomes involuntary exposure. Um, the what is 5G? What frequencies is it? How is it different from what we have now? Well, actually, it is both what we have now, but like on steroids and new, uh, new frequencies that we've never been exposed to for in the public sphere for commercial industry before in such a large way, millimeter waves and submillimeter waves. So the frequencies are low band, mid band and high band, meaning the lower middle frequencies and new high frequencies that um, there is less research, but there is research on that shows there are effects, especially to our skin, which is our, our largest organ. Um, and there is going to be, as I said, more exposure in documented studies where they've looked at the small cell tower rollout in communities and compared communities and found that those areas that had small cell networks in place had higher exposures for when you're walking outside, those environmental levels of exposure. Um, and uh, not to only talk about the destruction, because I'd like to talk about what's inspiring right now too, but an important piece of the puzzle is a lack of protections, not only for people, but for birds, bees, trees, wildlife, for our natural world. And if we're going to have all of our street lights and utility poles be replaced with cell towers, which is what industry is pushing for, what about our natural world and, and our trees? And there is research showing damage to trees from, from cellular radiation. There is research showing impacts to honeybee production, to bee behavior, to biochemical changes in bees. So <clears throat> the research that's looked at the higher frequencies um, really raises important questions because research has found that bees actually and insects and smaller creatures will absorb those smaller frequencies. The higher frequencies are actually a smaller oscillations of the wave more intensely into their bodies. What is that going to mean? To go to um, what you were raising about what's really working People are taking action around the world. We have 600 municipalities in Italy passing resolutions to halt 5G. Easton, Connecticut, um, Farragut, Tennessee, <clears throat> excuse me, communities in the United States passing resolutions to halt 5G. <clears throat> and um, several uh, incredible actions at the uh, local level are happening where there are ordinances that people are working on, asking for protections related to the fire risk of small cells and um, not having these installations near schools, having setbacks in New Hampshire, the, the New Hampshire Commission on 5G and the Environment pass an incredible report. I hope everyone's on the call and I'll put it in the chat, goes to look at the report of the New Hampshire State Commission on 5G and the Environment, where they recommend setbacks, uh, federal protections, and awareness program 
for the general public on how to reduce exposure, especially for children, especially for pregnant women, uh, federal protections for our natural environment and the development of standards that will protect our birds, bees, trees, and, and wildlife. So that report is very important. And as I understand it in New York, there is a bill that has been proposed that would be similar. Um, so this is happening. Now, at the same time, industry with deep pockets is pushing forward these streamlining bills. Like right now in California, the, there is a streamlining bills which would make it easier for companies to put up 5G small cells. And there's a lot happening there. We have that all on our website. You can, you can search that out. So there's a lot going on, but what I think is so important is that the conversation is happening. People are getting educated and talking to their elected officials and asking for them to be accountable and to address this issue. To our lawsuit, it's going very well. Uh, we are now awaiting a decision and we don't know what's going to happen with the case. We had the briefs, the back and forth of the briefs has happened. We had amicus briefs along with uh, from the Natural Resources Defense Council, the Building Biology Institute, um, a family that had been injured and as well a, a telecom attorney filed a brief with a statement by Dr. Linda Birnbaum, former director of the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences, documenting and talking about the National Toxicology Program study I mentioned earlier and how it is important to understanding this issue. So during the oral arguments, which were a few, gosh, now it's been, it was January 25th, the judge grilled the federal communications lawyer and ask the hard questions that really needed to be asked. Like, well, what about long-term exposure? How do you know it's safe? Where's the documentation that you went to the federal agencies and their committees, the FDA, and, and got the information needed? And so we were quite impressed and we are hopeful that the determination, which we expect soon, will be in our favor. Um, but we do know that this seemed to us to be one of the most important legal actions that needed to be taken because it was at the, because of the federal level, this is the basis of our problem. One of the basis of our problems is that we don't have protective laws. So if you are a parent in a school and you go to your school and you say, well, is this safe? You know, is it okay that you're bringing the 5G in for the kids or all of this new wireless, everything? They will say, well, it's compliant with FCC limits. In fact, it's so compliant with FCC limits. It's like a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand times lower than FCC limits. No worries on that. But our FCC limits are sky high, thousands of times too high to protect us. They allow so much more wireless radiation into the environment and into our bodies than is considered safe by many scientists. So that that took me a while to understand when I learned about this because I, I couldn't believe that such a bad mistake had been made <laughs> that we never tested for long-term safety. But just to give you an example of the numbers, um, you know, there are other countries that have limits a hundred times uh, lower, more restrictive than the United States. Now they're still not protective, but they're far more strict compared to the United States, Australia, Japan. And the thing is, in order to deploy 5G and in order to deploy 4G and, and do densification of the, the networks, companies are actively funding commercials and websites and PR to get those countries um, to make their limits less strict like Italy. They're trying to get Italy to change their limits because Italy has more restrictive limits to accommodate 5G and roll out 5G. They already did it with Poland. They got them to change their limits that were far more protective. There are a lot of Eastern European countries that have more restrictive limits on this. So if 5G is so safe, why is industry trying to make other governments change their limits on wireless radiation to accommodate it? 
So a lot's happening um, in, in, at the policy level and people are talking about this issue, which is really important to have the conversation and not just, oh, it's, over, you know, oh, it's everywhere. There's nothing we can do. There is something we can do and we, we need to do it now. Many hands make light work. That's my motto. Last year, you were raising $20,000 for this lawsuit. Are you properly funded to continue this lawsuit? We need a significant amount of money at this point to actually complete payment for the lawsuit. We owe, we ha we owe the lawyers uh, money. Yeah, almost 100000 or so. So we are actively raising money. We are thankful for donations to... Uh, this legal action and to our programming at Environmental Health Trust, we're a nonprofit and um, we make res we have a page with resources at ehtrust.org where we you can download. We have flyers you can share. We have um, information on 5G, fact sheets on climate impacts as well. These are free materials to download and share posters. Um, so a lot, and, and pages such as how to take action on 5G, where we link to other resources like 5G crisis and physicians for safe technology um, and Dr. Joel Moskowitz at University of California, Berkeley, who's working on this. So we are trying to get the message out and to address the federal, uh, the, the federal issue, which needs to be addressed is lack of protective limits. And then there's the Telecom Act. That's sort of one of the next things that needs to, we need to shine a light on because the Telecom Act uh, has um, a section in it whereby it's been interpreted in case law so that when you go to your local officials and say, I don't want that cell tower near my house. And I don't want it because it's, you know, there's this research showing there's harm from it. Those, uh, those elected officials will say, well, we can't talk about health. We can't stop it because of health, because of the telecom acts and the case law that has been interpreted, over-interpreted uh, in our legal uh, expert's opinion. Um, so that needs to be addressed. There's a lot of legal action happening. I heard there's another lawsuit. Oh, there's also a lawsuit happening with people who have alleged that their cell, their brain tumors were caused by their cell phone use to the head. And these are the people who used before 1996, before the Telecommunications Act was, uh, was passed. And it's been winding through the court for years now. And Dr. Chris Portier, who's the former, uh, one of the former heads of the department, environmental health department at the CDC, uh, submitted a uh, over 150 page report stating that there is strong evidence that wireless radio frequency can cause gliomas. And uh, that report is online on our website, or you can go to Microwave News as well that has these resources. Um, unfortunately, his, his report and his testimony is not going to be allowed in the trial, as happens in these cases where they, uh, it's, it's not, you know, I think it's egregious that it's not being used, but there is some new cases coming up as we understand it of people with brain tumors where um, this may, he may be able to be an expert witness. And there are many other expert witnesses, but there's just a lot going on, legal, policy. Um, so thanks for asking about the case 